Irrigation water management is the use of irrigation water in a planned and efficient manner. Basically, irrigation water management involves answering three questions. One, is an irrigation needed? Two, how much water should be applied? And three, will the application be uniformly distributed? To answer these questions, irrigators must understand the soil, water, and plant relationships of their crops. And they must know how to operate their irrigation systems to obtain a high water use efficiency in crop production. During the summer of 1983, the Soil Conservation Service initiated a program of evaluating irrigation systems in Oklahoma. This program is part of the technical assistance to local soil conservation districts. Five irrigation water management trailers have been equipped and stationed in Cimarron, Texas, Woodward, Jackson, and Stevens counties. Trained personnel accompany each trailer to the field and supervise the collection of data and make calculations for evaluation studies. Information on water infiltration rates critical to the proper design and operation of an irrigation system and cropping patterns, type of tillage, and other management practices can cause changes in infiltration rates. In the past, much of the technical assistance provided by the Soil Conservation Service has been devoted to the planning and design of irrigation water conveyance and field application systems. While good system planning and design ensures the required amount of water can be applied, proper management by the irrigator is required to ensure efficient use of water and energy. Evaluating an irrigation system points out any deficiencies in water use and shows where improvements are needed. Agriculture crop irrigation in Oklahoma is done using either one of the sprinkler systems or the gravity method, especially furrow systems. This program will demonstrate the test equipment in use and show how measurements are taken on a stationary sprinkler, a linear or lateral move sprinkler, and a furrow system. Let's look at sprinkler systems first. Seven main factors are checked when evaluating a sprinkler system. These are, one, system capacity. The system should be able to replenish soil moisture at a rate at least equal to the peak water use rate of the crop. Two, application rate. Water should not be applied faster than it will be absorbed into the soil. However, it should be applied rapidly enough to avoid excessive evaporation losses. Three, depth of application. During an irrigation, the depth of water applied to the point of lightest application should not be greater than that amount which will be retained by the soil within the crop root zone. Greater amounts should be applied only if it is necessary to leach harmful salts out of the crop root zone. Four, uniformity of application. There's a practical limit as to how uniformly water can be applied over a field. A generally accepted standard is the point of lightest application should receive at least 80% as much water as the average for the field. Uniformity of application is affected by differences in individual sprinkler heads along a lateral, as well as between laterals. Also, the uniformity of individual sprinklers affects the uniformity for the entire system. Five, water losses. The greatest water loss usually occurs through wind drift and evaporation as the water travels between the sprinkler nozzle and the ground. Water droplet size and application rates also affect these losses. For efficient water use, such losses should not exceed 10 to 15 percent of the flow through the system. Six, economical pipe sizes. Pipe should be sized so that there is an economic balance between pipe costs and pumping energy costs. Seven, crop damage. Water must be applied in a manner that will not physically damage the crop. Now, to follow through the evaluation of a stationary sprinkler system. The first step in evaluating any irrigation system is to measure how much water is being supplied to the system. With sprinkler systems, this is usually done with an inline propeller-type flow meter 
or a velocity meter from which flow rates can be calculated. An alternative method is to catch, measure, and totalize the flow from the individual sprinkler or spray heads. To evaluate the amount of water applied, catch cans are set out in a grid pattern, usually 10 by 10 feet. The first row of cans on each side of the sprinkler lateral are located one half of a grid distance, usually five feet away from the lateral. The sprinkler system is then operated for a period of time, usually two to four hours. The water caught on each can is measured and recorded as to the can location in the grid pattern. This data is converted to depth of water applied and plotted on a grid pattern. Using a systematic imposition of can catch from one row to another, it's possible to estimate what the final depth of water application would be. A visual examination of the plotted data will indicate areas that are obviously over-irrigated and under-irrigated. An irrigation water management test was conducted on a power side roll sprinkler irrigation system operated by Johnny Mahan in Caddo County. The irrigation well and pumping plant were adequate to operate a maximum of 40 sprinkler heads. However, at the time the evaluation was made, only 26 sprinkler heads were being operated due to the irregular layout of the field. The pumping rate was determined using both a velocity meter and totalizing the discharge from all 26 sprinkler heads. Catch cans were set out in a 10 by 10 foot grid pattern on both sides of the lateral, and the system was operated for three hours. The water caught in each can was then measured in a calibrated beaker and the data recorded. Nozzle discharge pressures were measured at the first and last sprinkler, as well as at the sprinkler located at the highest point of the field. The difference between the highest and lowest pressure should not exceed 20% of the design pressure. The results of the test were system capacity of 217 gallons per minute. Average sprinkler discharge was 8.34 gallons per minute. Highest nozzle discharge pressure was 49 PSI. The lowest nozzle discharge pressure was 44 PSI. The design nozzle pressure was 45 PSI. Average can catch was 0.81 inches. The average low 25% can catch was 0.58 inches. Gross application for the evaluation area equaled 1.03 inches. The average gross rate of application was 0.34 inches per hour. Application efficiency equaled the average catch divided by the gross application, and that came out to 79%. In other words, 79% of the water applied reached the ground. 21% was lost out of the area. Pattern efficiency is used to estimate the uniformity of water application. Pattern efficiency equals the low 25% can catch divided by the average can catch. The calculated pattern efficiency was 71%, while 80% is the recommended minimum acceptable efficiency. One of the major factors causing uneven water application is wind drift and that can be reduced by replacing the older style 23 degree trajectory heads with newer 17 to 20 degree heads. Evaporation losses can also be reduced by going to newer lower angle heads. Conversion to low angle sprinkler heads would result in increasing the system efficiency from 56% to at least 68%, which is the lower acceptable limit. Water losses should not exceed 10 to 15% of the amount pumped. However, this day was unusually hot and windy. No doubt the losses would have been within the acceptable range if weather conditions had been more favorable. The next irrigation water management evaluation deals with a self-propelled center pivot sprinkler system. While much of the terminology and calculations involved are the same as for the stationary sprinkler, the fact that the center pivot propels itself over the ground calls for a couple of modifications in data collection. First, only a single row of catch cans is involved. Typically, these are located on a radial pattern outward from the pivot 
with cans spaced a uniform distance apart. Once the pivot sprinkler has passed beyond the cans, water catches from individual cans are recorded. Here, the second modification comes in. As one moves outward from the pivot, each succeeding sprinkler or spray head irrigates a larger area than did its predecessor. To apply a more nearly uniform depth of water, each succeeding sprinkler or spray head must have a higher flow rate than the preceding unit. A procedure called weighting is used to adjust can catches to that area covered by the sprinkler. An evaluation was done on a self-propelled center pivot system owned by Dennis Mounts of Caddo County. This particular system was equipped with low pressure spray nozzles on drop pipes rather than conventional impact sprinkler heads. A single row of catch cans spaced 30 feet apart was set out. The system operated over the cans and the can catches measured and recorded. The basic system design called for 600 gallons per minute and 49 pounds per square inch pressure at the pivot. A velocity meter was installed next to the pivot to calculate the actual amount of water flowing through the system. System capacity was 460 gallons per minute. A pressure gauge was installed and measured operating pressure at the pivot was 22 PSI. Results of the evaluation were hours per revolution at 10% dial setting were 191.5 hours. Acres irrigated per revolution, 126. Weighted average can catch, 1.28 inches. Weighted low 25% depth of application was 0.84 inches. Pattern efficiency equals the weighted average low 25% can catch divided by the weighted average can catch. This is 65.6%. The weighted average can catch was 1.28 inches. The gross depth of application was 1.54 inches. The application efficiency equals the weighted average can catch divided by the gross application. This was 83.1%. System efficiency equals pattern efficiency times application efficiency, or 54.5%. Maximum application rate near the outer end of the system was 1.78 inches per hour. Visual observation of the system showed little movement of water over the soil surface and slight to moderate wheel rutting on the slopes. These observations indicate the rates of water application were not exceeding the water intake rate of the soil, which was fine, sandy loam. Remember, it's desirable for the application efficiency to range between 85 and 90 percent and the pattern efficiency to be at least 80 percent. Here, the 65.6 percent pattern efficiency is likely caused by the system being designed for 600 gallons per minute with 49 psi pivot pressure and 40 psi at the last tower. Actually, it's operating on 460 gallons per minute with 27 PSI at the pivot and 15 PSI at the last tower. Either increasing the water supply to 640 gallons per minute and 49 PSI at the pivot, or re-nozzling the system to 460 gallons per minute would increase the pattern efficiency and probably increase the application efficiency to a minimum of 85%. In reality, 460 GPM is not sufficient to meet the water needs of 127 acres of summer crop. The third type of sprinkler system to be evaluated is a continuous side-moving tower-supported sprinkler system called a linear or lateral move. Its towers, tower drive units, and pipeline look very much like those of a center pivot. It moves laterally across the field rather than around a central pivot this particular system is owned by Jerry Rhodes in Texas County. It's hose-fed from an underground pipeline, and the end tower carries an engine-driven generator to power the individual tower motors. This end tower also has the steering control mechanism. The actual rate of travel is controlled by one of the center towers, and pressure switches keep the towers aligned. Here, the testing procedure consists of using a single row of catch cans spaced a uniform distance apart. Once the spray has cleared the row of cans, individual can catches are measured and recorded. 
System pressures are measured at the first and last sprinklers and recorded. Here are the findings of the evaluation. Time required to cover the field at 6% dial setting, 170 hours. Area irrigated per pass, 115 acres. Design system capacity, 1,200 gallons per minute with 29 PSI at the first tower. Design end gun capacity was 50 gallons per minute at 19 PSI. Measured system capacity was 750 gallons per minute with 15 PSI at the first tower. No end gun was being operated. Gross average depth applied was 2.45 inches. Average can catch was 2.43 inches. Low 25% can catch was 1.22 inches. Pattern efficiency equaled the low 25% can catch divided by the average can catch, and that was 50.2%. Application efficiency equaled the average can catch divided by the gross average application, and that was 99%. Pattern efficiency times application efficiency equals system efficiency and that was 49.7%. An application efficiency of 99% is exceptional and indicates climatic conditions were ideal during the test. The pattern efficiency of 49.7% is significantly below the generally accepted minimum of 80%. The major cause of this low pattern efficiency is probably that the system was designed for 1,200 gallons per minute and 29 PSI at the first tower while the actual measured capacity was 750 GPM and 15 PSI at this first tower. Rates of application, as well as the diameter of area covered, are significantly affected by operating pressure. The remaining type of irrigation system to be evaluated is a furrow system. About 45% of the total acreage irrigated in Oklahoma is done using either furrows or corrugations. Efficient furrow irrigation is dependent on a proper balance of soil texture, furrow slopes, length of furrow, and size of furrow stream. A good rule of thumb to use in estimating maximum size furrow stream is the maximum non-erosive furrow streams should reach the far end of the irrigation furrow in about one-fourth of the total time required to make the desired depth of application. This furrow system was located on Johnny Bryan's farm near Guyman, Oklahoma. Irrigation furrows are spaced 56 inches apart and are 2,575 feet in length. The slope along the furrows is 0.25%. The soil is a Ulysses clay loam. Based on auger samples, it was estimated that the first one foot had a moisture deficit of two inches while the second, third, and fourth feet had a deficit of 1.1 inches each for a total net irrigation requirement of 5.3 inches to bring the top four feet up to field capacity. The first steps in evaluation procedures are to, one, measure the lengths and spacing of water furrows and flag approximate quarter points along the furrow so furrow stream advance can be timed. Two, determine furrow slope. Three, Install flow measuring device in water furrows so furrow flows can be determined. Here, small flumes are installed in several adjacent rows so flow rates can be averaged. Orifice plates can also be used. Four, since this system is a gated pipe distribution system, an inline flow meter is used to measure the total water supplied to the irrigation set. Had it been a ditch and siphon tube distribution system, it would have been necessary to subtract estimated ditch losses. The system is started and the individual furrow flows equalized. The starting time is recorded and furrow flow rates recorded once the stream has reached the flumes and flow rate stabilized. Here, 1,515 gallons per minute is divided among 30 furrows, giving an average furrow stream of 50.5 gallons per minute. The flumes confirm this flow rate. The times at which the furrow streams reach the quarter, half, three-quarter, and end points of the field are used to approximate the amount of water intake into the various sections along the furrow length. 
In this case, the furrow stream reached the 700-foot mark in 25 minutes. The 1,300-foot mark in 1 hour 10 minutes after starting. The 2,000-foot mark in 4 hours and 25 minutes. And the end of the furrow in 12 hours. Since the ends of the furrows were dammed or diked, there was no tailout water runoff. Had runoff occurred, it would have been necessary to measure the amount so adjustment could be made to the water intake along the furrow. Irrigation was continued another 12 hours, making it 24 hour total set, and then it was cut off. The times at which the water receded down the furrows past the various stations were head of furrow, 24 hours, 700 foot station, 24 hours and 15 minutes, 1300 foot station, 24 hours and 30 minutes, 2000 foot station, 24 hours and 45 minutes, end of furrow, 34 hours. The amount of time lapse between the advance and recession times at a station is referred to as opportunity time. It's that amount of time during which there was opportunity for water intake into the soil. This is a plot of the advance and recession times versus distance down the furrow. The time interval between the two curves represents the opportunity time for water intake. The sudden upturn on the right-hand end of the curves indicates the ponding effect due to the ends of the furrows being dammed up. Had runoff occurred, the recession curve would have continued with much the same curve as up through the 2,000-foot station. This is a plot of depths of water applied along the furrow. The desired depth of application was 5.3 inches, which would bring the top four feet of soil up to the field capacity. The actual depths of application ranged from a high of 10.18 inches to a low of 8.64 inches at the 2,000 foot station. The distribution efficiency, which is a representation of how uniformly water was applied along the length of the furrow, was 84.9%, which is very good. Pattern efficiency, which is a comparison of the least depth applied along the furrow to the desired depth of application, is over 100%, since all points along the furrow had intakes of more than 5.3 inches of irrigation water. Intakes greater than 5.3 inches indicate water lost to deep percolation. Had some points received less than 5.3 inches of water, then pattern efficiency would begin to have some meaning in the evaluation process. Application efficiency is the comparison of the average depth of water stored in the crop root zone to the depth of water actually applied. In this case, the desired depth of application was 5.3 inches to bring the soil moisture up to field capacity in the top four feet. 9.6 inches were pumped Thus, application efficiency equals 5.3 divided by 9.6, or 55%. The application efficiency could be improved by dividing the furrow length in half and using cutback furrow streams once the shorter furrows had become wet along their entire length. Increased labor requirements would need to be weighed against the possible pumping energy saving to determine the economic feasibility of such a change. Evaporation losses would likely be reduced somewhat using the shorter furrow lengths, but the primary saving in the amount of water pumped would come from reduced deep percolation losses below the crop root zone. Pumping irrigation water is an energy intensive operation. How one manages the water once it's pumped can have a significant impact on energy costs. Oftentimes the changes in management practices required to improve efficiency are relatively inexpensive. For example, shorten length of irrigation run to avoid excessive deep percolative losses. Use maximum non-erosive furrow streams to wet the furrows, followed by cutback furrow streams to apply the desired depth of application. Change irrigation sets when they're due for a change, rather than waiting until it's more convenient. Improve your ability to evaluate soil moisture conditions so irrigations can be better timed to plant growth and development. Other examples may require spending money. For example, construct a tailout water collection and recycling system. 
re-nozzle sprinklers or spray heads to better fit the irrigation system water supply. Land leveling or land shaping can sometimes be a benefit to water handling and management. Now here's Bob Day, irrigation specialist with the USDA Soil Conservation Service. Most irrigation systems are designed to be efficient. However, changes do occur. Sometimes these changes are so gradual that they are very seldom noticed. The Soil Conservation Service has initiated a program of evaluating irrigation system. This program is available through the local Soil and Water Conservation District. This is the person you need to contact in your county for this assistance. Remember, a good irrigation water management plan complements an irrigation pumping plant, which in turn saves energy.